I think then you've now gotten through all of the gradient boosting, the vanilla, quote unquote. I, so everything that you said so far sounds super amazing. But now I'm adding this vanilla adjective because it turns out today there's been several variants on the regular vanilla gradient boosting that you've described to get even more powerful results. I think uh, so like things like XGBoost, LightGBM, CatBoost. You want to dig into those? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. So all of that was foundational and very important. However, up until 2014, gradient boosting, again, I'm not an expert or researcher, but my impression, or historian for that matter, but my impression is that gradient boosting was purely or mostly theoretical. It had um, wasn't very applied, very applicable, because it was slow. Because when you're building these hundreds of decision trees, you have to find the splits. And imagine you have, like, for example, for salary, you have a thousand uh, estimated salary, right? So you have your thousand, even you have, with only with just a thousand uh, people in your, um, uh, just a thousand people in your sample, you need to make that split. How do you know it's going to be at 47,000? How does the decision tree, like the one of the decision trees, how does it know that it needs to split at 47,000 more or 47,000 less? Why is it not? Uh, 46 and a half thousand why is it not 93,000 why is it not 12,000 or 12,534 dollars like how does the decision tree know and if you have a thousand samples it has to um, of course there's optimization techniques built in but it has to like look through a lot of options to find out where is that best split which split is going to give me the best result because it only can choose one at each each ranch it can only choose one split so it has to look through you know, like even if you have just three variables, it has to look through three variables and through all possible splits inside these variables. So it like theoretically, it's a cool algorithm, but unless you find ways to speed it up, it's just going to stay theoretical and you're going to get bogged down. It's very slow. Um, and that's exactly what happened in 2014. Uh, a um, gentleman named Tian Qi Chen, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, as part of the uh, what is it called? You're, you're basically guaranteed to not be pronouncing that right because <laughs> you're not going to know how to do the tones. But yeah, I guess yeah, yeah. Chan yeah, Chen is a good guess for us uh, people that can't hear tones. Unless, can you hear? Like, do you hear like are you Chinese tones? Is that something that like you study? No, no, I, um, I have no idea. So I, I apologize if I mispronounce that. I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, so I'm just gonna. I was just looking up the abbreviation for XGBoost. So XGBoost was originally uh, produ um, introduced in 2014 as part of this uh, community called DMLC, it's on GitHub, called Deep Machine Learning Community. And it was produced by this uh, um, gentleman, Tianqi Chen, who I believe was a student at the time, or uh, maybe or he's a professor right now. I'm not sure which university. I think it, I would guess Carnegie Mellon. I'm not sure. Um, but basically... Uh, he produced uh, this as part of this uh, open source community in 2014. And the whole principle of XGBoost, it's the XG stands for extreme gradient boosting. So the whole principle was to come up with ways to speed it up, as I understand, was to come up with ways to speed it up so we can actually use it in applications and not leave it as a theoretical algorithm uh, for the rest of time. So um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you remembered correctly. Your instinct was right. Uh, Tian Qi is an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon, though it seems like uh, they're also a co-founder and chief technologist at something called OctoML. So they're oh. one of those amazing people who is, who's bridging academia and practical uh, data science. Um, Octo AI is running, tuning, and scaling the models that power AI applications. We should have them on the show, John. Yeah, it's a great Sounds idea. like a for sure. Sounds like my big great that's, guest. That's that is certainly the kind of guest I love. We have we had uh, quite a few guests. Um, yeah, where they they do both of those things, where they're academics right on the cutting edge yeah, yeah, of yeah. developing machine learning, but then simultaneously they're at the cutting edge commercially. That is that is one of my favorite guests. You're exactly right. Yeah, if if the, anyone listening knows Tianqi Chen, author of Exibust, please shoot him an email and introduce him to the podcast. We'd love to talk to him about it. That'd be cool. Uh, anyway, we're di digressing. So um, after the method came out in 2015, it became very popular. Uh, the research paper 
there was a follow-up research paper from Tianqi Chen, which you can find um, on archive. It's called XG Boost, a scalable tree boosting system that was published in 2016. Um, okay, so after the method came out, it became super popular. For example, in 2015, the year after it came out, out of the 29 winning solutions on Kaggle, 17 of them used XGBoost. I think eight of them were pure XGBoost and nine of them were a combination of XGBoost and deep learning. But nonetheless, uh, 17 out of 29, more than half of the winning solutions in Kaggle, literally the year after, were already using XGBoost. That's how popular it was. And also on the KD Nuggets Cup in 2015, again, the, the next year, XGBoost was used by every winning team in the top 10. So how cool is that? Um, and that's because, as like again, uh, I'm not uh, a researcher, but as I understand, uh, XGBoost was the transition from theoretical gradient boosting, which sounds amazing, but is very difficult to apply because of its computational inefficiency and demand for resources and you know other things. It was the bridge to apply applied gradient boosting. Nice. Did you mention, and I just didn't quite catch it, that the that XG Boost stands for Extreme Gradient yeah, yeah, Boost? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you said that? Uh, yeah. Well, there you go. Now I reiterated it totally on purpose. Yes, <laughs> Extreme Gradient Boosting. Um, okay, so, uh, and to this day, like, it wasn't just 2015. To this day, XG Boost and LIGBM and CAT Boost, which we'll talk about just now, are some of the top used non-deep learning algorithm. So when you look at, I think, uh, Christian Ch Ch Chabot, is that Christian Chalet or Chabot? Uh, the, the creator of Keras, what, what was his name? Oh, uh, Francois, Francois Chalet. Francois Chalet. Fran I was thinking of the founder of Tableau. Um, Francois Chalet uh, did a post, I think, in 2018, where he looked at, okay, what are the, mo yes, it was 2018. He asked the top, uh, like, first, second, third place uh, teams on Kaggle, which uh, methods they used, and between 2016 and 2018, and uh, it turns out like the first place is Keras, uh, which is deep learning, but the second place is a uh, LightGPM. Third place is XGBoost. So uh, even um, to this day, they're still being used. Um, anyway, so let's dive back into what is the difference between what did XGBoost? What what is great about extreme gradient boosting that um, wasn't so great in normal gradient boosting? So first thing, it uses special kinds of decision trees. Uh, the way the decision trees, like in um, in normal gradient boosting, the way they're constructed is called is by greedily. is a technical term. Greedily choosing the one uh, split that maximizes the reduction in loss function across all possible slits in each step. So it looks for the one, the maximal, the best split. Whereas in XGBoost, uh, it uses something called similarity score. And then it uses a gain calculation. So basically, it uh, looks at, okay, so uh, the way to think about this without going into the mathematics is how similar are the, uh, the observations? So we have, like, let's say our, our first split, right? So we have those 1,000 observations, like this is tree number one. We're looking at the errors. So we have uh, those 1,000 errors. Like, how similar are those errors between each other? Right, you calculate a similarity score, and then you can have the split in different areas. So for each split, and it has an optimized way of not going through all these possible splits. Uh, for for example, the salary uh, variable, there's an optimized way that it it uh, um, looks at fewer of them uh, with a certain step. But we're not going to go into that into detail on that. But basically, it looks at okay. So what's the if I do the split here? What's the similarity score on the left of the split and on the right? Right. So if I do a split in this branch. I'll end up with two leaves. What's the similarity score of the observation that will end up in the left leaf? And what's the similarity score between the observations, between among each other, uh, the, of the ones that will end up on the right leaf? And so then you calculate a gain, which is calculated as uh, similar. So you want similarity uh, to be higher. So the higher the similarity, the better. So you want, and so the gain is calculated as similarity of the left leaf plus similarity of the right leaf minus the similarity that you originally had in the leaf that you're currently splitting. And what that does is like if the gain is greater than zero, that means that you're going to actually gain something from doing the split. Uh, if it's less than zero, you're not going to gain anything. And also you want to find the split with the highest gain. So that's that's number one. They're a special kind of decision tree. The way they think about the splits is uh, through similarity scores and gain calculation. The second thing is tree pruning. So you build this tree. 
it builds it depth wise. So it goes from level, level one to level two, where you have, uh, you know, you have your branch, you split into two areas, two splits, then you split again, you split into four, then you split again, you split into eight. So it builds it depth wise. Uh, and then it prunes it. So pruning is like cutting it, remove, going from the bottom to the top and looking at the gain that you have in each one of the, in each one of the leaves, the gain that we just talked about. And if, and then you have a hyperparameter gamma. So when you're building XGBoost uh, model, you'll see a hyperparameter gamma. That is for this pruning. So gamma, let's say you set it to 100, or let's say you set it to like 110, for example, um, just not to have round numbers. So you have 100, 110 is your gain or your gamma. If your gain in a certain leaf is less than gamma, right, then you will remove that leaf, um, and then you'll go to the next one. If the go up the branch. If the gain is again less than gamma, you will remove that leaf and so on until you hit a leaf with a gain more than gamma. And that way you reduce the size of your decision trees. Uh, that's called tree pruning. Next one is regularization. Uh, regularization, um, um, it, uh, XGBoost has built in regularization. So it's not something you have to add separately. It has built in L1 and L2 regularization. And re basically without going into detail, uh, regularization helps with um, overfitting. So it helps with preventing overfitting. Uh, next one is sampling. So as we discussed earlier, XG, uh, or gradient boosting, it uses all of the samples, right? So you, use, you have a thousand samples, there's no bootstrapping you every time. So the first time, if the first, if the zero, zero model zero used a thousand samples, you take the average. For the next model, you take um, a thousand errors and you build that model. The next model, you take a thousand errors of that model and so on, so on, so on. So XGBoost has built in uh, sampling of rows. So you can tell it that I don't want to use a hundred rows. There's a hyperparameter for this. I want to use 80% of the rows. So now each tree will only see a random 80% sample. So let's say tree number one will see 80% of the rows. It'll be built on that. Tree number two will see a different 80% of the rows be built on that tree number three, and so on and so on. Uh, also does sampling of columns. Uh, you can, as we discussed with John, you can tell it to sample 80% of the columns or whatever percentage you want. Or you can build it on all of them, but there's a hyperparameter for sampling columns. There is a built-in cross-validation, k-fold cross-validation if you want. Um, and also, without going into detail on the technicalities of this, it was, XGBoost was developed with high scalability and performance in mind. So there are additional optimizations specifically for hardware uh, and for accelerated computing, uh, basically, and also supports distributed computing uh, for to handle very large data sets. So uh, XGBoost was built or modified or was built with all those things in mind. And as a result, um, it's very efficient and it allows it to do more optimization cycles in the same a period that a different model will do. And that's what makes it so incredibly superior. Like I think it was actually Francois Ch Chalet, if I'm not mistaken, that said that the winning teams are the ones that, uh, like this isn't Kaggle, but of course the same thing applies in, in industry. Like the best models are the ones that where you can um, iterate more, more times in the same given time. So you want your model to be super efficient, super fast. Yeah, it's super fast. And that's also key for when you get your model into production where it's ideal, obviously, if your costs are lower, you don't need as much compute to be able to support lots of users using your model in real time and in, in that production infrastructure. So valuable for sure.